Well, here we are once again uh, to study another lesson in this series on the parables. Have you been blessed so far? Yes. It's a lot of good information in the parables. You know, this is kind of a change of pace. We usually deal like with the sanctuary and end time events and prophecy. Uh, this year we're doing something a little different, but the parables have a lot to say about prophecy too, don't they? Amen. It's amazing. Okay, we're going to study lesson 46. It's on page 341. Once again, I want to encourage those who are watching this to get a copy of the syllabus. It's very important to have the syllabus. You'll get a lot more out of the classes uh, if you are able to fill in the blanks and uh, look at the page numbers and look up the quotations for yourself. Before we begin, we want to ask God to bless us in our studies, so let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for the lessons that you have been teaching us. Thank you because you are a God that communicates your will. We ask that as we study this lesson about the seven spirits that come and possess the house once it's been emptied and not filled again, that you will help us to learn the lessons that will be beneficial to our own spiritual life. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are going to move through the first part of this lesson very quickly because this is one of the longest lessons in the syllabus. I probably should have divided it in two, but I figured that uh, I didn't want to add any more lessons to the syllabus. So let's go through the expressions and the symbols. The title of the class is The Strong Man and the Seven Unclean Spirits. So let's take a look at the expressions and symbols very quickly. What does the house represent? The house that is garnished represents the self-righteous soul. Who is the strong man who originally lived in the house? The strong man was Satan. We find in under question number two, Satan is driven out by Christ. Number three, of course, is the same quotation because it tells us who um, was stronger than the strong man. And of course the answer is Satan is driven out by Christ. So the one stronger than the strong man is Christ. The strong man is Satan. And the garnished house where Satan lived originally represents the self-righteous soul. Are you with me? Number four, who helps Jesus expel the original evil strong man who is Satan? Well, the answer is Jesus is speaking here. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So how did Jesus cast out the demons? By the Spirit. So Jesus and the Spirit work together. The Spirit does the bidding of Jesus. Now let's read the note. This is very comforting. Clearly, Jesus and His Spirit are more powerful than the strong man and all his demons. When Jesus began His ministry, the demons revealed their great fear of Him when they asked, Have you come to destroy us? That's the big fear that Satan and his angels have because they know that Christ is more powerful than them. Moreover, in Gadara, Jesus cast out a legion of evil angels. A legion of soldiers was between three and five thousand. So Jesus cast out a legion of evil angels from the two demon-possessed men. It behooves us all to ally ourselves with the one who is stronger than the strong man. Amen. Number five, can the strong man and the stronger man dwell in the same house? Oh, they don't like each other. <laughs> Jesus stated every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. 
So it's either one or the other, the strong man or the stronger man, not both. Let's read the note. Satan and Christ can no more dwell in the house together than light and darkness can coexist. Jesus made it clear that no one can serve two masters. The flesh and the spirit cannot abide in the same place. And Ellen White in Desire of Ages 3, 23 and 24 made this well-known statement, we must inevitably be under the control of the one or the other of the two great powers that are contending for the supremacy of the world. We cannot serve both. We cannot serve both at the same time, or serve one and then serve the other, serve the one, serve the other, and be back and forth. It's either or. Now let's talk about expelling the strong man. Of course the stronger man expels the strong man. So let's take a look at the expelling of the strong man. Is the expelling of the strong man a once for all event or does it involve a continual battle? Well, Desire of Ages 3, 23 and 24 we find the answer. We may leave off many bad habits. For the time we may part company with Satan but without a vital connection with God, through the surrender of ourselves to Him every week. No, moment by moment we shall be overcome. So how frequently do we have to make sure the strong man is out of there? Oh, it's a battle, it's an ongoing battle all the time. She continues, without a personal acquaintance with Christ, and a continual communion, we are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do his bidding in the end. In another statement, Review and Herald, January 24, 1893, Ellen White wrote, The garden of your heart must be cultivated. How frequently? How frequently do you have to pull out weeds? Well, you know, I, have, I don't have a garden like Dr. Teske now. Dr. Teske has a garden, and he brings stuff to us here at Secrets Unsealed. But I plant some tomatoes and some peppers just because I have a very small area. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's a continual battle pulling those weeds out of there. You don't do it once for all. Do you, Dr. Teske, once for all? No. So... Once again, the poisonous satanic plants must be uprooted. The soil must be prepared, thoroughly plowed by the Word of God, and the precious seeds of truth must be sown and tended by a wise and skillful gardener. And who is that skillful gardener? Jesus, spiritually speaking. When the farmer prepares the soil for planting, he pulls the weeds and cleanses and fertilizes the field. Is that what happens when the strong man is cast out? Is the, is the, is the man cleansed? Absolutely. However, the soil must be occasionally cultivated. Oh, thank you. Must be constantly cultivated. And the weeds pulled, or the weeds will eventually take over and damage or kill the crop. Likewise occurs with the heart. Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit, cleanses the soil of the heart. That's the expelling of the strong man. However, if the weeds are not regularly uprooted, if you don't keep the house clean, they will take over and kill the spiritual life. So now let's talk about the strong man's recruits. <laughs> See, the strong man has helpers. So when he's cast out of a house, the house is clean, but then it's not filled with anything good. So what does the strong man do? Well, let's notice there's several questions that cover this, this question. Why do you think that the strong man goes to dry land to recruit his seven companions? That's what the parable says. He goes to the deserts and to the dry lands. Well, because that's where the, de the demons live. 
Isn't Satan going to live on a desolated earth, on a wilderness, a desolate wilderness? Absolutely. So that's where they live. <laughs> so he goes to the desolate land where all of his, where, where all of his helpers are. And he recruits them. Now let's read the note. The Bible describes Satan and his angels as dwelling in a desolate, inhospitable, dry and infertile land. In contrast, the Bible describes the Holy Spirit in the context of rain and fertility, right? So you wouldn't expect the devil to go to nice green pastures to recruit his helpers. <laughs> you would expect him to go to the place where he belongs. And that is the dry, inhospitable desert. Now what happens when the soul does not allow God to expel the garnishing of self-righteousness once and for all? Well, here's the answer. The garnished house represents the self-righteous soul. Christ drives out Satan. Now here comes the key to the parable. However, he returns in the hope of finding entrance. He finds the house empty, swept, and garnished. Only self-righteousness is abiding there. Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So what happens if Satan is expelled from the person, from the mind, and then Jesus is not invited to come and dwell where the strong man was expelled from? Oh, the strong man says, hey, you know, I'm in this wilderness, there's no rain, it's kind of a terrible place to live. He says, you know, let's, he, he finds seven companions, he says, let's go check out the house that, I, that the strong man, the stronger man cast me out of. And he comes back and he finds the house just as empty as it was when he was cast out. He has sometimes swept and garnished his house, and put on the garments of joy and gladness. In other words, sometimes he's filled the vacuum. However, he did not surrender himself, what? Fully, for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And after time, what happens? Old habits reasserted their power. He failed and went back to his evil practices, and his condition became worse than it was before he made the attempt to reform. So it's not enough for the stronger man to str cast out the strong man. We have to invite the stronger man to stay. If you don't, if you leave the house empty, then the strong man's going to go, he's going to recruit helpers, and he's going to come back to see if maybe the house is still empty, and he's going to occupy the house. Number four, what is the meaning of the word dwell? Well, the parable says, Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. We'll come back to that last, uh, that last uh, sentence. The parable does not use the word dwell, this is important detail, to describe the place where the strong man originally lived. The word dwell is not used when he originally was there. The fact that the stronger man cast out the strong man from the house indicates that it was not the strong man's permanent dwelling at that point. He did not dwell there. He was a tourist. But now notice. However, when the strong man returned with the seven companions, the parable tells us that they dwelt in the house. The word dwell in Greek here refers to taking up permanent residence. It is the same word that is used in the book of Revelation to describe the wicked as those who dwell on the earth, the earth dwellers. It means that their entire focus is the earth, the wicked. That expression, earth dwellers, doesn't seem, simply mean that they live on planet earth. It means that this is their abode. They are earth-focused. 
And so that's the word dwell. When he comes back, he says, I'm going to make this my permanent house. It wasn't his permanent house originally because he was cast out. Now, let's talk about the return of the strong man. What is the significance of the strong man returning with seven of his companions? The number seven typifies totality or completeness, as seen in the following examples, and this list is not exhaustive, it is only a sampling. God created the entire world in seven days. The blood sprinkled on the mercy seat seven times totally cleansed the sanctuary. Israel marched seven times around Jericho and the city was completely destroyed. The Revelation describes Jesus as having seven horns, meaning that He has totality of power. Revelation depicts Jesus as having seven eyes, that is, fullness of wisdom. The seven spirits stand before the throne of God representing the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Naaman came out totally clean from the Jordan when he submerged himself seven times. So the number seven indicates totality or completement. So what's going to happen with this house when the strong man returns? He's going to totally and completely take it over if you don't fill it after it's been emptied. When the strong man and his companions come to dwell in the house, this is the top of page 344, they take total and complete control and as a result, the state of the house, as the parable says, is worse off than when the strong man originally lived there. Are you catching the picture of what this parable is talking about? Number six, must a person choose to serve the kingdom of darkness in order to come under its dominion? Must you choose to serve the kingdom of darkness? No. Ellen White uh, in Desire of Ages 3, 23 and 24, wrote, It is not necessary for us to deliberately choose the service of the kingdom of darkness in order to come under its dominion. We have only to neglect to ally ourselves with the kingdom of light. All you have to do is not invite Jesus to come into the empty house. And the devil will come and he will possess it. Now this parable is fulfilled first in the destruction of Jerusalem. There is, there is always a Jewish application because Jesus told the stories to them. So let's take a look at how this points to what happened to the city of Jerusalem. To whom did Jesus originally address this parable? Matthew 12, 45 states, Then He goes and takes with Him seven other spirits more wicked than Himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And then Jesus amplifies it. He says, so shall it also be with this wicked generation. So now we're not talking about an individual, we're talking about a what? A generation. Did Jesus want to find entrance into the hearts of the Jewish nation? He did. The question is, what happened to that wicked generation for refusing Jesus to dwell within it? This is question number two. After describing the calamities that would befall Jerusalem, Jesus told the disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And Jerusalem was destroyed in that generation. How does Ellen White describe the spiritual condition of Jerusalem immediately before its destruction? Listen to this. By the way, there's two times in the history of, uh, the, history of the world where Satan took total control of a city or a nation. One was France during the French Revolution. And the other time was when Jerusalem was destroyed. Satan had control of the nation. Notice what Ellen White says. The great sin of the Jews was their rejection of Christ. See, they didn't let Christ come into the house. 
The great sin of the Christian world would be the rejection of the law of God, the foundation of His government in heaven and on earth. Let me ask you, is the law a reflection of Christ's character? Yes. So would it be the same thing to reject the law as to reject Christ? Yes. It would be kind of ridiculous if you said, well, I accept this person personally, but I don't accept his picture. <laughs> Duh. The law is the picture of Jesus, written, uh, it, you know, it's the written uh, form. Mm -hmm. So you can't say, I love Jesus and hate the law, because the law is a reflection of Christ. Amen. So the great sin of the Christian world would be the rejection of the law of God, the foundation of His government in heaven and earth. The precepts of Je Je Jehovah would be despised and set at naught. Millions in bondage to sin. Slaves of Satan, doomed to suffer the second death, would refuse to listen to the words of truth in their day of visitation. Here you catch a glimpse that what happened with Jerusalem is going to happen with the world. Does this parable have end time relevance? It most certainly does. Because she begins speaking about the great sin of the Jews and then she says the sin of the world is going to be similar. Number four. Who possessed the nation immediately before the destruction of Jerusalem? This is a vivid illustration. Satan aroused the fiercest and most debased passions of the soul. Men did not reason. They were beyond reason, controlled by impulse and blind rage. They became satanic in their cruelty. In the family and in the nation, among the highest and the lowest classes alike, there was suspicion, envy, hatred, strife, rebellion, murder. Satan was at the head of the nation, and the highest civil and religious authorities were under his sway. That's what happens when you refuse to let Jesus in, in terms of the nation. Is that going to happen to the United States of America? The, 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 the strong man hasn't totally yet taken possession of the house, but it's well on the way. Five, page 345. What warning does God give us in the destruction of Jerusalem? You know the destruction of Jerusalem, Matthew 24 has two applications, right? With the literal Jewish nation, it prefigures the destruction of the world. Every ray of light rejected, every warning despised or unheeded, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest. The Spirit of God, persistently resisted, is at last withdrawn from the sinner. And then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. Is this a good description of the parable? See, we have, see, Jesus not only gives a parable, but this is talking about real historical events. And we're going to see it's talking about real people too. There's biblical examples of individuals. She continues, The destruction of Jerusalem is a fearful and solemn warning to all who are trifling with the offers of divine grace and resisting the pleadings of divine mercy. Now, not only does this parable apply to what happened to the Jewish nation, they, they said, we don't want Jesus in our house. And so state, Satan took possession and took total control. But we have individual illustrations in Scripture. It applies to individuals as well. What happened with Saul? King Saul, when God called him to be the first king of Israel. Oh, 1 Samuel 10, verse 6, 9 and 10. Notice this. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, God said to Saul, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. In other words, Saul at the beginning was a converted man who had the Spirit. So it was, when he had turned his back to go to, from Samuel, that God gave him another heart. 
and all those signs came to pass that day. Verse 10, when they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. So did, um, did he invite uh, the stronger man into the house? Yeah. But did he persevere and keep him in the house? No. The story of Saul was the story of one disobedience after another. And so he failed to keep the stronger man in the house. Let's go to number two. How did Ellen White describe Saul's early experience? As Saul united with the prophets in their worship, a great change was wrought in him by the Holy Spirit. The light of divine purity and holiness shone in upon the darkness of the natural heart. He saw himself as he was before God. He saw the beauty of holiness. He was now called to begin the warfare against sin and Satan. Are you understanding this? It's a constant war to keep the stronger man in. And it says, and he was made to feel that in this conflict he must come, uh, once again, um, he was made to feel that in this conflict his strength must come wholly from God. What happened with Saul? He did not persevere. He allowed, uh, he allowed himself to disobey God on several occasions. And so what happened to him as a result? Was he possessed by Satan? Notice number three. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Was the Spirit in him when he began? We notice, yes, it departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord. It means that God stepped back and he allowed the evil spirit to come in. The evil spirit from the Lord troubled him and Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Saul failed to keep the strong man out and as a result an evil spirit persistently tormented him and at the end of his life Satan made his abode in his heart to the point of consulting a witch and his life ended when he committed suicide. You catching the picture? The illustration of this parable? There's another individual that illustrates this, Korah and his co-conspirators. Number four, did Korah and his fellow conspirators receive a direct revelation of the divine glory? Yes, they started out well. Ellen White explains, Patriarchs and Prophets 396, Korah and his fellow conspirators were men who had been favored with special manifestations of God's power and greatness. They were of the number who went up with Moses into the mount and beheld the divine glory. But what happened in the course of time with Korah and his cohorts? Number five, however, since that time a change had come. A temptation, slight at first, had been harbored and had strengthened as it was encouraged until their minds were controlled by Satan. So who took his abode in the house? Satan. And they ventured upon their work of disaffection professing great interest in the prosperity of the people, they first whispered their discontent to one another and then to leading men of Israel. What was the tragic end of Korah? So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. A good beginning does not guarantee a good end unless you carry on a continual battle to make sure that the stronger man stays in the house. Because if you don't fill the house with the stronger man and you leave your house empty, 
the stronger, the strong man is going to go and he's going to get some cords, he's going to come back and he's going to overwhelm you. Now there's another example, Balaam. What was Balaam like at first? Number seven. Was Balaam always the covetous person that Numbers 22 to 24 describes? No. Balaam was once a good man and a prophet of God. But he had apostatized and had given himself up to covetousness. Yet he still professed to be a servant of the Most High. By the way, are all of these individuals who at first were believers? Yes. See, once again we come to the same point. The sin of covetousness, which God declares to be idolatry, had made him a time server. And through this one fault, Satan gained entire control of him. It was this that caused his ruin. Did Satan totally possess him? Yes. And it led to his ruin. What great lesson did Balaam fail to learn? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon, or money. There's another example, Judas Iscariot. Did Judas claim to be a believer? Did he have a good start? Notice this comment, Desire of Ages 7.17. What was Judas' attitude in his early encounter with Jesus? Judas loved the great teacher and desired to be with him. He felt a desire to be changed in character and life, and he hoped to experience this through connecting himself with Jesus. Good intentions at first. He says he loved Jesus. What led to his apostasy? Once again, the idea that you can have both the strong man and the stronger man in the same house. No. You have the stronger man cast out the strong man, and then you invite the stronger man to stay, and you, you make sure that he stays. What led to the apostasy of Judas? Judas was divided in heart. He loved the praise of the world. He refused to give up the world for Christ. He never committed his eternal interest to Christ. He had a superficial religion, and therefore he speculated upon his master and betrayed him to the priests, being fully uh, persuaded that Christ would not allow himself to be taken. Did Satan possess Judas? Notice John 13 verse 27. His tragic end. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Was he demon possessed? Yes. yes, he was. When Judas left the upper room, into the darkness of the night, his heart became the abode of the prince of darkness. Like Saul, he ended up committing suicide. This is solemn stuff, isn't it? So what does Ellen White have to say about serving God with a divided heart? Well, let's take a look. Obviously, we're not going to be able to read all of the statements on this page because there's just too many pages to cover, but you have the syllabus. Uh, maybe I'll just go through them quickly. But he will not share a divided heart. What will Jesus not do? share a divided heart. If it be given to the service of mammon, if selfishness and pride fill its chambers, there will be no room for the heavenly guest. He will not take up his abode with us until the soul temple has been emptied and cleansed. See, there's an allusion to the parable that Jesus told. She continues in Adventist Home 515, Greetings for Amusement. Confuse faith and make the motive mixed and uncertain. The Lord accepts no divided heart. He wants the whole man. The next statement, 
Men are on the enchanted ground of the enemy. Things of the least importance, foolish social parties, singing, jesting, joking, engross their minds, and they serve God with a divided heart. The declaration of Christ, no man can serve two masters, is unheeded. By the way, OFC is Our Father Cares. It's a devotional book. The next statement, God will not occupy a divided heart or reign from a divided throne. Every rival that holds the affections and diverts them from the God of love must be dethroned. The Lord demands all that there is of us and there must be no reserve. The next one, the time has come when every soul must stand or fall according to his own merits. A few righteous acts, a few good impulses may be presented to the mind as evidences of righteousness, but God requires the whole heart. He will accept no divided affections. The whole being must be given to him or he will not receive the offering. And we have this question, what does the text mean which says, Cleanse you, your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded? It means that some have been serving God with a divided heart. They esteem God some, but themselves more. And now comes this solemn statement at the bottom of the page. Half Hearted Christians are worse than infidels. <laughs> Why would that be? For their deceptive words and non-committal position may lead many astray. The infidel shows his colors. The lukewarm Christian, there's the connection with Laodicea, right? The lukewarm Christian deceives both parties. He is neither a good worldling nor a good Christian. Satan uses him to do a work that no one else can do. Let's see what Peter and Paul had to say about this, uh, this parable that Jesus told. How did the Apostle Paul describe those who once walked with Jesus but turned away? This is a solemn passage from Hebrews 6 verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. So did they experience conversion at the beginning? Yes, but now notice. If they fall away, to renew them, them again to repentance, since they crucify again to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. No such thing as once saved, always saved. There will be a constant battle as long as we are in this world to keep Jesus on the throne and to keep the strong man off the throne. Amen. Number two, what example from nature does Paul provide to illustrate the end of those who turn away from the Lord? These are the following verses. He gives an example from nature. For the earth which drinks in the rain, rain represents the Holy Spirit, right? That often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. And then the Apostle Peter has this solemn, this solemn passage in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 20 to 22. He says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, is it possible to escape the pollutions of the world and then not uh, fill the mind or fill the house and, and fall back again? Yes. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Does that sound similar to what Jesus says, that it's worse when the, when the, the 
a worse end when the seven come back with the strong man? Yes. Verse 21, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a soul having washed to her own wallowing in the mire. Now, Ellen White explains that the experience of those individuals in this parable is illustrated by the seed that fell by the stony places. So let's go through this material on the stony places as quickly as we can. Ellen White explains, There were many in Christ's day, as there are today, over whom the control of Satan for the time seemed broken. Through the grace of God they were set free from the evil spirits that had held dominion over the soul. See, she's speaking about the same theme as the parable. They rejoiced in the love of God, but like stony ground hearers of the parable, they did not abide in His love. They did not surrender themselves to God daily, that Christ might dwell in the heart. And when the evil spirit returned with seven other spirits more wicked than himself, they were wholly dominated by the power of evil. So it's the, the parable is equivalent to the seed that fell in stony places. So what does it mean, the stone, that, that this seed fell into stony places? Well, let's pursue it. There are two problems with the kind of soil where the seed fell in the, among the stony places. Luke 8 verse 6 explains that this soil lacked moisture. What does moisture represent? The Holy Spirit. Matthew 13, 5 and 6, this is why we need to study more than one gospel, underlines the fact that the soul in stony places had no depth of earth. In other words, it was a superficial relationship. And therefore, when the sun was up, the plant was scorched. In the people represented by the soil, Ellen White explains, selfishness of the natural heart underlines the soil of their good desires and aspirations. And then she states this, this class may be easily convinced and appear to be bright converts, but they have only a superficial religion. What does the note say? These are the people who have a form of godliness, but lack the power thereof. They are half-hearted Christians. They want to serve Christ and self simultaneously. They serve Christ with a divided heart, and no one can serve two masters. And then I already read this statement that's under that. Ellen White continues in Christ's Object Lessons, page 46, It is not because men receive the word immediately, nor because they rejoice in it, that they fall away. They do not consider what the Word of God requires of them. They do not bring it, that is the Word of God, face to face with all their habits of life and yield themselves fully to its control. I'm going to skip the note. I'm going to go to where it says the scorching sun. We're still talking about the stony ground. See, there's no depth of soil. There's little moisture. And it says, when the scorching sun, which withers the plant, represents what? According to Matthew 13 and verse 21. When tribulation and persecution arise because of the word, they fall away. These are prosperity gospel Christians. When everything goes well, fair weather. <laughs> But when they start suffering tribulations and, and persecution, they fall away. Stony ground hearers are those who enthusiastically receive Christ in the good times. They expect that Christianity will spare them from trials and tribulations. While things go well, they appear to be good Christians. But when they are required to make a sacrifice for what they believe, 
they fall away. And you can read Matthew 10, 34 to 39, where you have a, a further amplification of this. At the bottom of the page, the kind of soil represents, this kind of soil represents those who rejoice for a season. For they think that religion will free them from difficulty and trial. But when trials come, they faint beneath the fiery test of temptation. They cannot bear reproach for Christ's sake. When the Word of God points out some cherished sin or temptation or requires self-denial or sacrifice, they are offended. It would cost them too much effort to make a radical change in their lives. Are you catching the picture of what kind of people we're dealing with here? Christ's Object Lessons, page 48. God cannot accept half a heart. Last I knew, half a heart won't function. Christ asks for an unreserved consecration, for undivided service. He demands the heart, the mind, and the soul, the strength. Self is not to be cherished. He who lives to himself is not a Christian. Now let's talk about emptying and filling very quickly because time is flying by and I want to get to the global application. Must we fill our minds with Christ? How do we fill our minds with Christ? It is by meditating on His Word. We assimilate Christ by His Word. Jesus said, the flesh doesn't profit anything. It is the words that I speak that are spirit and life. When we get into the Word, we assimilate the Word, we are assimilating Christ. There's power in the Word. And in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, we have the secret. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. And notice what the result is. That you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Review and Herald, January 24, 1893. Ellen White wrote, The parable of the man from whom an evil spirit had been cast out, who did not fill the soul with the love of Christ, illustrates the necessity of not only emptying the heart, but of supplying the vacuum with a divine occupant. That's what we've been talking about. And notice how Ellen White says we fill our mind. How can we barricade our souls after the strong man has been expelled? She answers, may God help us to gather up the jewels of his promises and deck, this is an ex favorite expression of Ellen White, deck memories hall with the gems of his word. We should be armed. Notice, this, this is a warfare. We should be armed with the promises of God. Our souls should be barricaded. This is military language, isn't it? Should be barricaded with them. When Satan comes in with his darkness and seeks to fill my soul with gloom, what do you do? You come out with what you put in your brain. <laughs> I repeat some precious promise of God. You see, we are changed into the likeness of Christ by what we behold. I had a student, best student I ever had. He would sit in the front seat with his notebook, his Bible open, with his pen, and from the time the class started till the class ended, he had his eyes glued, paying attention. Best student, best grades. He now teaches at Southwestern Adventist University in the theology department. Several years later, I was uh, preaching in a certain location, and uh, a sister came and said, uh, Pastor Board, do you know so-and-so, the name of the student? I said, oh yes, I know him very well. She says, you preach just like he does. <laughs> What's the point I'm trying to make? He sat there for three years. Something's going to rub off. By the way, have any of you ever seen Teeny Finley? She's just like Mark. The way she moves her arms and the way she inflects her voice, it's like you're seeing Mark Finley. Why? Well, I guess they've lived together for a while. And I guess Mark Finley does rub off, right? Notice this statement under number three. 
How can we make sure that we keep the citadel of our heart clean? By beholding Christ, by talking of Him, by beholding the loveliness of His character, we become changed. Changed from glory to glory. And what is glory? Character. And He becomes changed from character to character. Thus we see that there is a work of purification that goes on by beholding Jesus. Now I'm going to skip down over to the other page, the global end time application of this parable. As we have seen, the parable of Jesus applies to individuals, to the Jewish nation, when it was destroyed by the Romans. But there is a third and broader application still, it describes the apostate religious world when God withdraws His Holy Spirit from the earth. How does Ellen White apply the parable to the end time generation? She states, It is as true now as when Christ was upon the earth, that every inroad made by the gospel upon the enemy's dominion is met by fierce opposition from his vast armies. The conflict that is right upon us will be the most terrible ever witnessed. But though Satan is represented as being strong, as being strong, Strong, notice once again, as the strong man armed, she's applying this parable to the end time, isn't she? His overthrow will be complete, and everyone who unites with him in choosing apostasy rather than loyalty will perish with him. Number two is tremendous. What will be the condition of the religious world shortly before the second coming of Christ, after the close of probation? She says, the forces of darkness, that's Satan and his angels, will unite with human agents who have given themselves into the control of Satan. And the same scenes, this, this is key, the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be revived. We are going to repeat the history of Jesus in Gethsemane and on the cross. Through yielding to satanic influences, men will be transformed into fiends. A fiend is a demon, by the way. And those who were created in the image of God, who were formed to honor and glorify their Creator, will become the habitation of dragons. And Satan will see in an apostate race his masterpiece of evil, men who reflect his own image. So the final conflict is going to be those who perfectly reflect the image of Satan and those who perfectly reflect the image of Christ. What's going to happen with Babylon at the end of time? The religious world. Is it going to be, be inhabited by demons because they did not allow Jesus to come in and teach them the truth to lead them to obey the truth? Listen to this statement. It comes from Great Controversy 603 and 604. A terrible condition. She's commenting on, on, you know, being filled with demons, every hateful bird that we read before. A terrible condition of the religious world is here described. With every rejection of truth, the minds of people will become darker, their hearts more stubborn, until they are entrenched in an infidel hardihood. That's when he comes with the seven companions, folks. In defiance of the warnings which God has given, they will continue to trample upon one of the precepts of the Decalogue until they are led to persecute those who hold it sacred. Christ is set at naught in the contempt placed upon His Word and His people. As the teachings of spiritualism are accepted by the churches, the restraint imposed upon the carnal heart is removed and the profession of religion will become a cloak to conceal the basest iniquity. A belief in spiritual manifestations opens the door to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and thus the influence of evil angels will be felt in the churches. Are you catching the, 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 the global fulfillment of this at the end of time? What will happen when Jesus ceases to intercede for the human race? I've, made, I've alluded to this before. She says the restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed, and Satan has entire control of the finely impenitent. Full control. In other words, he's come with his seven companions, and he dwells there. 
Number six, why will God allow Satan to fully possess an apostate race? She says, the world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, and trampled upon his law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. The Spirit of God persistently resisted, has been at last withdrawn. And then Ellen White in the next statement describes the fierce winds of human passion. And she says that the elements of strife will all be let loose when the winds of strife are released. And she ends the statement, at the very end of the next statement, the whole world will be involved in a ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem. Is God going to send a message to the world before that? Warning people to get out. Get out of Babylon. Because if you don't, it's, going to, it's the habitation of demons. The demons will totally overwhelm you. Yes. What heavenly message does God send to the religious world just before Satan takes full control of the impenitent? Ah, oh, Revelation 18, verse 1. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was filled with his glory. And in verse 4 this angel says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. She's a habitation of demons, of every hateful bird. She's filled with evil spirits. And then the invitation is given. Come out of her, my people. Now isn't it true that if, we, if people are going to come out of Babylon, Babylon has to come out of them first. You see, you have the experience in Sodom, as it was in the days of Lot, so will, be at the, will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. You see, you have two kinds of believers also in the days of Lot. You have Lot and his wife. Right? Lot's wife came out of Sodom, but Sodom had not come out of her. And so she was destroyed. And so folks, as individuals, we must be committed fully and completely without reservation to Jesus Christ. We must invite the Holy Spirit to dwell in us every day, every hour of every day, in order to keep the strong man out. And not only the strong man, but all of his cohorts, all of those that work with him. And remember, Jesus said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ is much more powerful than the strong man. He is stronger than him. And he's able to give us the victory over every besetment in our lives. Amen.